Good morning. Welcome to God's house. Happy to have you all here this morning. We've reached the second Sunday in the season of Lent. There are countless lessons that the season of Lent teaches us, but one of the most important is the one that we'll be covering today. It's a lesson that we can't just learn in one Sunday. It's a lesson that takes an entire lifetime to learn. It is that the cross comes before the crown, both for Christ and for us. So that will be the focus of our worship this morning. Please join in singing our first hymn, number 466. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, 
and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Job, the first chapter, beginning at verse 13. Everyone knows Job's story, right? Especially Christians, but even out in the world, when someone is in the unbelieving world, when someone is suffering tragically, they, they, they know, they relate it back to Job, you know? You're suffering. There was a guy in history who suffered 
immensely too. His name was Job. That's all the farther that most people go in their thinking, though, that what Job suffered was just some terrible injustice. It was all just totally meaningless. What we fail, if that's as far as we go, what we fail to understand is that God used the, the suffering that he allowed Satan to inflict on Job for Job's good. And we already see that here in the, in the first chapter, even before we spend 40-some chapters uh, listening to Job and his friends uh, discussing what the meaning of his suffering was, we, we find the meaning. We see how God is using Job's suffering to draw him closer to himself, how, how after Job had lost everything, he realized he, had, he still had the most important thing that was God. We see when Job loses everything, he falls down on his knees and worships the Lord. And that's the good that came out of the evil in Job's life. One day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their oldest brother, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the female donkeys were grazing nearby when the Sabaeans swooped down and took them away. They put the servants to death with the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the flocks and the servants and consumed them. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and plundered the camels and took them away. They put the servants to death with a sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and were drinking wine in the house of their oldest brother. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it collapsed on the young people, and they died. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped. Then he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. In all this, Job did not sin or blame God. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our psalm of the day at Psalm 22 on page 71.
The second lesson comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 1. Here Paul kind of works us logically through the, the good that comes from bearing the cross in our lives, from suffering. He even goes so far as to say that we ought to rejoice in our sufferings, and, and to us, especially to Americans who, who avoid pain at all costs. That sounds shocking. That sounds ridiculous. Why would you rejoice in suffering? I hate to use this term because it's kind of corny, but God uses it as cross-training. He he weighs us down under suffering and under different crosses in our lives so that we look to the cross of Christ. It's there where we understand exactly what it is that God did for us. When we are weighed down under our crosses, we, we understand how powerless and weak and sinful we are. And then we look to the glory of Christ's cross, where He became what we are, weak and powerless. He suffered and He died to save us. Our crosses point us to the cross of Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out, poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly, It is rare indeed that someone will die for a righteous person. Perhaps someone might actually go so far as to die for a person who has been good to him. But God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, it is even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, It is even more certain that since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And not only this so, is this so, but we also go on rejoicing confidently in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received this reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, number 371.
please stand for the reading of the Gospel. We read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, be killed, and after three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But after turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have your mind set on the things of God, but the things of men. He called the crowd and his disciples together and said to them, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. After all, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? In fact, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, who from his cross urges us to take up our own crosses. In 1969, an author by the name of Lawrence J. Peter developed what is known as the Peter Principle. You may have heard of it. This principle asserts that in any organization, employees or members of the organization will, will rise through the ranks based on their competency until the point where they become incompetent. That is, until they reach the, the, the level or the rank where their skills and their talents are no longer sufficient for the job. And it's kind of amusing, actually. He, he, he says, taken to its logical extent, its logical end, if the organization exists long enough, eventually you're going to have, at every level of the organization, someone who is incompetent. They can't go up any further, and they're not competent to carry out the tasks they are given. It's kind of a funny, satirical way of thinking about hierarchies in, in organizations and businesses and military. Today, we're going to apply that Peter principle to none other than the Apostle Peter himself. So where do we find Peter today? Is he, is he rising through the ranks on, based on his competency, or has he, has he run into his ceiling where, where he's now incompetent? He's not, his talents and his skills aren't sufficient for that position. I think we'd have to say both. In the, the verses right before our text, Peter was the only disciple to properly answer Jesus' question, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered by revelation from God the Father, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the height of Christian competence. That is as, as wise as we can be to confess that this humble carpenter's son from Nazareth is in fact the long-promised Christ, the Son of God. And then he hits his ceiling, right? When Jesus starts to explain what it means to be the Christ, what the Christ was sent here to do, then Peter dares to teach Jesus. And he takes him aside and he rebukes Jesus. He reveals his incompetence. For that reason, Peter is often kind of a Lenten whipping boy. You know, he, he's trotted out and all of his failures, all of his errors are, are shown forth. And, and you're, 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 to, you're told to look at Peter, you know, the, the denying disciple, the weak disciple, the scared disciple. You're, said, don't, you're told, don't be like Peter. Thank God for saving you from being Peter. Get out there and be better than Peter. That's kind of the, the Lenten Peter principle that's so typical today. We're not going to go down that route. We're actually going to see how in these very words, Peter shows himself to be more competent as a disciple of Christ than we often are. Peter at least listened intently and carefully to Jesus' words. 
Do we? How well do you actually know your Bible? Would you be able to recite the Ten Commandments on command? Would you be able to list the books of the Bible in order? Or even on a more basic level? If I were to ask you or someone were to ask you tomorrow what this sermon that you heard here today was about, would you have an answer to it? We often suffer from an incompetence of not really listening to Jesus' words. Martin Luther picked up on this in his commentary on the third commandment in his large catechism. He, he criticized those who, who don't really listen to the word of God. He said this, uh, he said, those who listen to God's word like it was any other trifle and only come to preaching because of custom, they go away again and at the end of the year they know as little of God's word as at the beginning. Can you really say that you've grown in your Christian faith if, if Sunday after Sunday goes by and you just sit there and you're not really listening, it's going in one ear and out the other? I don't think you can. And the point of being here is not that you're just in the presence of the place where God's word is read and spoken, it's so that you would listen to it, that you would take it into your own being, that you would comprehend it and understand it and remember it and cherish it. It's, it's a sin of indifference if we don't. It's a sin of indifference if we think we can just show up here for one hour a week and we're doing our job. We're, we're doing what God wants us to do. At least Peter listened. You can tell by his reaction. Now, it's a wrong reaction, granted, but uh, the wrong reaction is better than no reaction. If you walk out those doors and, and you've had no reaction to what you've heard today, one of two things is is probable, possible. Either I've failed you miserably, or you just weren't really paying attention. Your mind was wandering to what's on the menu for brunch or some other thing. It's not a good sign if we don't have any reaction. That's, that's indifference to God's word, and we can't be indifferent. Peter shows his competence in that he at least listened carefully to Jesus' words. Before we tie Peter to the whipping post this Lenten season, let's see another side of his competence. That he understood the true horrors of the cross. That he understood how awful it was what Jesus was describing lay in his future. That's probably one of the reasons that Peter rebuked Jesus. He understood this is a terrible thing. This is awful. Maybe he could accept the fact that the chief priests and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would grumble against Jesus. After all, their forefathers had grumbled against Moses and the kings and prophet after prophet. That was pretty normal. But to actually succeed in handing him over to the Romans so that he could be crucified, so that he would have to hang on a cross, slowly bleeding out, eventually suffocating to death, that was too much for Peter to stomach. He could not accept the fact that that's what lay in the future of his friend. How do we react to Jesus' words here? Speaking plainly to us that he is going to have to undergo the most excruciating kind of death possible for us. We're kind of spoiled here as Lutheran Christians, aren't we? If you come from another church or if you visited other churches, you know that we're spoiled in how, how the cross is literally everywhere for us as Lutheran Christians. It's in our architecture. It's in our hymns. It's in the creeds we confess. It's in, all over our liturgy. It's in the sermons that we hear. The cross is literally front and center of everything that we do as Lutheran Christians, but there can be a downside to that right? That we grow numb to what a cross really means. It's pretty and it's golden. It's not really, though. Not a cross. A cross is a tool of execution where, where criminals were nailed through their hands and their feet to die in the most horrible way possible. Have we lost sight of that? Have we become numb to that? Do we hear Jesus' words and they kind of just pass right by us because we're dulled to what Jesus is really saying here? If you've seen the, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ, maybe you remember having an actual visceral reaction to what you saw depicted there on that screen. 
It, were, it wasn't just words on the page anymore. It was, it was you could see a man portraying Jesus and all of the suffering that he had to go through. I know that, that many people have. I've talked to grown men who said that they've come out of that movie with tears streaming down their faces. But what happens the, the second time you see it, the third, the fourth time? It's kind of dulled, right? Your reaction is kind of dulled. It, it goes away. It doesn't, it's like a callus on your hand. The more you do it, the less reaction you have. I know a Lutheran pastor who called that movie spiritual pornography because of that fact. That it dulls you to, to the suffering that Jesus really underwent on our behalf. We shouldn't become dulled to that. We should never be able to hear these words that Jesus says that he's going to be rejected and suffered and nailed to a tree for us. At least Peter understood how horrifying such an end was for his Savior. One final thing that Peter understood where he shows his competence is that he saw the injustice of it all. He had been with Jesus for three years. He knew. Jesus had never said an evil thing, never done an evil thing. He had never said a bad word about anyone. In fact, he had spent his whole ministry trying to help people and heal them. He knew it would be nothing less than the greatest crime in human history for the church and the government to collude in executing the sinless Son of God. That's another reason why he probably reject, rebuked Jesus. He said, it's not possible. They can't even concoct something, some reason to have you executed. How could you possibly think that this is what's going to happen in the future? That was Peter's reaction. What, what's our reaction? Isn't it sometimes, well, what else do we expect Jesus to do? That's his job. That's why God sent him here. That's what the prophet said he had to do. He's here. It's his job to die. We kind of take it for granted, right? You don't rebuke a bird for flying in the air or a fish for, for swimming in the ocean. Why rebuke the Son of God, the Messiah, for coming to do what he came to do? You realize how cold and th ungrateful that attitude is? It would be like if one of your children enlisted in the military and then Sadly, they were killed in battle, and someone came to you and said, why are you so shocked? Isn't that what they signed up for? You see how cold and ungrateful that attitude is? To, to let Jesus' words here describing what he's going to undergo for us to just go in one ear and out the other where we have no reaction at all. It's just, that's what he came to do. Why should we expect anything different? Have we really become so dulled, so cold to think, yeah, God really just had to kill his son on a cross? Knowing how wicked and evil and ungrateful we are? Now I think I have your attention, right? I, I think I can actually see the repentance, the, the changing of your minds. I can see you thinking, I'm really going to take my study of the Bible more seriously. I'm really going to remember how horrific dying on a cross was. I'm really going to remember that this wasn't just something that should happen, that Jesus died on a cross. It was unjust. It was not right, according to our reason, that the sinless Son of God would have to die for miserable sinners like us. Be careful with that. Be careful making those commitments because you know where that leads, right? It leads right where it took Peter, from, from the height of competence to, to his ceiling of incompetence. He, he reaches that point finally where he's in over his head. He no longer qualifies. He's no longer talented enough to carry out the task which he has before him. And he reaches that point when Jesus starts explaining what being the Christ is all about. The suffering and death, the rejection, the pain. Now, Peter took these words seriously, but he didn't understand them as a divine necessity. You know, Peter, Peter said, we think, you know, he took Jesus aside and said, Lord, 
maybe it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe we can figure out a different way, an easier way, that one that doesn't involve you suffering or, or me suffering. He didn't understand that these were divine necessities. This had to happen. Jesus said so. The prophet said so. God, in his mercy from before the beginning of time, said so, that these things had to happen. But, but we kind of have the same reaction, too, to some of the things that the Bible says will happen in our lives, right? The Bible says that following Jesus as his disciple is not going to be easy. It's not going to be a bed of roses. This is what the Bible says will happen if you follow Jesus. We must go through many troubles on our way to the kingdom of God. Everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. Dear friends, do not be surprised by the fiery trial that is happening among you to test you as if something strange were happening to you. And yet, even though the Bible says, guarantees these things are going to happen if you follow and confess Christ, how do we react when they actually do happen in our lives? Why, God? Why are you beating me up this way? We act surprised. Even though God told us beforehand, this is what's going to happen if you follow Christ in this hostile, unbelieving world. These are divine necessities. Our cross is a divine necessity just as much as Jesus' cross was. But Peter couldn't see that. Peter couldn't see the divine necessity of Christ's cross because he, he didn't take seriously the last part, right? And after three days, rise again. And put yourself in his shoes. It is. The cross is meaningless. It is ridiculous. It is useless. It is pointless without Easter. Paul said as much in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sin. The cross is meaningless without Easter. And for Peter, he couldn't see the, the crown of Easter, the crown of eternal life, the crown of the resurrection that stood behind the cross. All he could see was the gore of the cross and he couldn't see the point of it all. He couldn't see the meaning of it all. And so to him, Christ's suffering and death and rejection was just meaningless. And, and he's right, without Easter, Christ's suffering is meaningless. Are we any different though? Don't we often think of the crosses that the Lord gives us to carry as, as totally meaningless? What is, the, what is the Christian cross? I, I think the best way for us to understand it is those responsibilities, those pains, the, the things we suffer that are directly related to our vocation. So if you're a husband and wife, putting up with a sinful husband and wife is one of the crosses that you bear. If you are a mother or a father, Dealing with disobedient children is one of the crosses that God asks you to bear. If your children, dealing with impatient parents is one of the crosses you're given to bear. Of course, there are the general crosses where we face hostility and ridicule and rejection and persecution. But whatever those crosses are, they are directly tied to following Christ. There are things that we wouldn't have to endure except for the fact that we follow Christ. But don't we often regard them as so meaningless? Thinking, God, if you just took this cross away from me, I'd really be able to live my life. When the truth of the matter is that for Christ, going to the cross was exactly what it meant to be the Christ, to be the Savior. For us as Christians, the crosses, the sufferings that we endure in this life don't get in the way of living life to the fullest. They are what it means to live the Christian life to the fullest. Suffering under the cross, being weighed down in your vocations in this world, that, that shows you that you belong to Christ. Just as he was weighed down by his cross, so you are weighed down by yours, you meet him there at the cross. That's something we'll never see until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see what Peter eventually did. All he could see was how meaningless it would be for Jesus to suffer, to be rejected, and to be executed at the hands of the Romans. He couldn't see beyond that. He couldn't see the meaning. Most importantly, he couldn't see 
what Jesus talks about the, were the things of God. He couldn't see the big picture. He couldn't see why it had to happen. Peter didn't understand at this point, and not until much later, that this is not just some great tragic coincidence or accident. That this was God's plan. That Jesus had to suffer and die. That if we were to be saved from eternal destruction in hell, Jesus had to suffer that for us. Peter didn't understand that that was the meaning of the cross. Really, he didn't get the gospel yet. And the gospel that comes out of the cross, the meaning that is hidden behind the gore there, is, as the banner says, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. As sinners, we were doomed to be damned forever. And that was going to happen unless Jesus stepped in and took it as our substitute. But here's the good news. And if you don't remember anything else from the sermon today, remember this. Because of the shame that Jesus faced on the cross in your place, you don't have to be ashamed of any of the shameful thoughts that have passed through your mind your entire life. Because Jesus was tortured in your place, you won't have to be tortured in hell forever for the ways that you have tortured the people you love. Because Jesus died on that cross, you won't ever really die. That is, you won't ever be separated from God now or eternally. That's God's perspective on the cross. And when you see it that way, the cross is not meaningless at all, is it? It also gives meaning to the crosses that we carry. Crosses that we carry that can seem so meaningless that just get in the way of, of living our life to the fullest where we think, Lord, if you just took this thorn out of my flesh, if you just took this situation out of my life, I would be able to serve you so much better. Those serve a very good purpose. Remember, Christ went to the cross in order to save us from sin, death, and the devil. And the reason we bear the cross as Christians is because Christ has redeemed us from sin, death, and the devil. They are intimately connected because of Christ's cross. That's why we carry our cross. And God uses those crosses. Like we said, like, Peter, or like Paul said in Romans chapter 5, he uses them to train us, to take our minds off of the things of this world and to place them on the things of God, to stop thinking only in terms of this lifetime and to start thinking in terms of eternity. They are weights that he uses to train our faith, to strengthen our faith. They're also like guardrails that keep us on the narrow way to heaven. Just think of it this way. When is your mind more focused on Christ and the cross and the life that is to come? When your life is going along just fine or when God throws you a series of curveballs? Certainly it's when we're suffering that we're more focused on getting out of this place rather than making the most of this place. And if that's the meaning behind whatever cross you're carrying right now, that's not meaningless. That's God bringing you closer to himself and one step closer to heaven. Does that make it any easier to carry the cross, knowing the meaning behind it? I don't think so. Because I think at this point we've reached our ceiling of competence. No Christian can fully understand how God uses the crosses that we face in our life for our good. You're never going to be able to understand it. You can't come into my office and ask me, Pastor, why am I undergoing this? I I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that God is using those things for your good. He's using them to draw you closer to heaven Most of all, he's using them to to take your minds off of the things of men, off of the things of this world, and to place them on the things of God. To place them on, on Christ and his cross. Because it's there on that cross where God brought out of the 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 most evil thing that mankind has ever done, the greatest good that God has ever done for us. He's brought about the crown of our salvation. And he did it through the cross. Amen. Please stand for the response.
Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in good. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bless the Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn number 434.
always my privilege to proclaim the Word of God to you, especially today as we consider the Peter Principle. We could learn a lot from him as far as taking God's Word seriously and understanding just how wonderful a gift Jesus is from God to us. But we also need to pray that God would open our eyes to see more than what Peter saw, that we be, may be more competent so that we could see the meaning, the, the saving meaning before, behind Christ's cross and before our own crosses. May God bless your day and the rest of your week.